thank you, and thank you for joining us. Uh, so I'll talk about ProGuard, which is the optimizer and obfuscator that's already part of the Android SDK. Uh, so I'm curious now, it, it has been in the SDK for a while. Has anyone been using it? Can you show hands? That's great. Cool. So for anyone else, I hope to convince you uh, in this talk uh, that you should at least give it a try, maybe. And uh, for everyone, I'll show you some tips and tricks uh, that you can use to get the best out of ProGuard and maybe avoid some problems that you could uh, run into. Uh, my name is Eric LaFortune. I'm from Belgium, and my background is in research and also in development. And right now, I have my startup company. So I'm the sole developer of ProGuard. ProGuard in a couple of keywords uh, to start with. Uh, so it's an open source project. It has been for a long time. And it's actually a generic uh, program, a generic processor of Java bytecode. It takes bytecode. It processes it so that it becomes more compact, more efficient, and also more difficult to reverse engineer. And the end result is Java bytecode as well. So this is something that you might keep in mind, uh, may want to keep in mind if you run ProGuard and you get uh, errors or problems. Uh, ProGuard doesn't really know about uh, Android as a, a system. It's only the way in which it's configured that makes it run for uh, Android as well. A brief history of ProGuard. So it's uh, quite a mature pro uh, project by now. Uh, I started it as a hobby in 2002, that's more than 10 years ago. And in those days, uh, it was mostly used for um, constrained environments like applets, something that's, uh, that has disappeared now. And then later on, uh, it became popular for midlets, the, the early Java applications on cell phones. And then later on, it became popular for Android applications. And uh, all, the, all that time, it has also been popular for Java applications in general, and that's mostly because of the obfuscation aspect uh, of what it does. Uh, so over time, ProGuard has grown gradually. I've worked on it diligently day uh, or at night and on weekends. Uh, and uh, it was already being picked up early on when uh, Android apps came along. But it really started uh, for Android development when uh, there was this small incident that you may remember. Uh, Google introduced the license verification library, and only a week or two after that, someone already posted how you could circumvent that library uh, quite easily. So then Google recommended to use uh, an obfuscator like ProGuard on your code to make that a little bit harder. And then a couple of months later, they actually included it as part of the Android SDK. And uh, it was still a hobby at that time, and it, it grew and it grew. Um, and in the end, something had to give. And uh, I, I worked on it at night and on weekends, but eventually I founded a startup to work on it in the daytime, and at night and on weekends. So first of all, I'll start, start on a, a higher level. Uh, why would you want to use ProGuard? Uh, I'll, I have a few items here, application size, performance, logging uh, removal, battery life that it can improve, and protection of your applications. And I'll uh, just show some practical results to give you an idea of what you might expect uh, if you run ProGuard on your own application. So first of all, an, a few experiments with application size. I've processed the API demos that you're probably familiar with. And initially, they started with a size of 760K if you just look at the classes of DEX file that's inside the APK file. Now, if you apply ProGuard in your build process, there is a reduction of that file in size by a third, approximately. Now, that classes of DEX file obviously is only part of the APK file, which is larger. And if you look at the reduction in size of that APK file, there is a reduction of uh, something like 4%, which is a, li a bit less impressive. But the API demos are quite clean. There's not much 
um, overhead in them. There's not much uh, luggage uh, that you don't need. If you look at a more realistic um, application like the Google I.O. app of last year's, uh, there is a reduction in the class dex file size by 75%. And overall, that's still a reduction of the APK file size uh, by a half. And this is because the Google I.O. app uses a lot of external libraries. And it's probably using just a few classes from each of those libraries, and all the rest of it is just uh, unneeded. And this is what ProGuard does very well. It figures out what's needed and what's not needed in your application, and it removes everything else. So you can have quite large libraries, only use a couple of classes in them, like the Apache libraries, say, and ProGuard will uh, just keep for you uh, everything that you're actually using in your application. Uh, there is a more extreme example, which is the API demos in Scala, which was uh, an external experiment done by Stefan Michelou. And uh, he rewrote uh, the API demos in Scala, or used the rewritten um, API demos. And uh, there was a reduction of 90% in uh, the size of the class of the DEX file, and 70% of the APK file. And the reason here is that the Scala runtime is quite large. And even then, if you have a, an, a moderately large application, um, there's a lot of unused stuff in that uh, runtime library, and ProGuard can remove all of that. Um, the initial sizes were approximately 6 megabytes and approximately 8 megabytes. That's just an estimate, because actually he couldn't run uh, his Scala applications on devices, uh, or he couldn't build them, because they were simply too large. They were bumping into the size constraints of uh, the... the classes of the DEX file, for instance, which is something that Facebook already uh, experienced as well. Okay, on to performance then. So there is a reduction in size, but there is also an improvement in performance. And uh, for this test, I've picked the caffeine mark benchmark. It's just one of the many benchmarks that's available out there, and I've picked this one because it makes ProGuard look good. Uh, <laughs> Because if you would pick a GPU benchmark or an I.O. benchmark, you wouldn't see much difference. Uh, ProGuard just operates on Delvic uh, or on, on the bytecode. It doesn't do anything on GPU code, say, or uh, graphics code or I.O. code. And in this case, there is an overall improvement of something like 18%. And this is quite typical if you have uh, computationally intensive uh, applications. Uh, there's, in this case, very often, not a single problem with performance in, in applications, but there's often the problem that you suffer in performance by a thousand paper cuts. There are little getters and setters that uh, eat some performance. Uh, all these little places in your application that you couldn't really realistically uh, improve on by hand. ProGuard does all that for you, so it can inline getters and setters, and that actually makes a, an important difference on the Android platform in the on the Delphic virtual machine. It doesn't make a difference on uh, more advanced virtual machines like the, the Java virtual machine on the desktop, but on, the, uh, on embedded devices, on small devices, the Delphic virtual machine still benefits a lot. OK, then on to battery life. And this is a quote I received a couple of months ago, and I thought it was uh, nice enough to, to show to you. Uh, where someone reported that he had a five times battery life improvement just by applying ProGuard. Now that seemed quite surprising and it just turned out that he was uh, uh, writing a background service, a long running background service, which was doing a lot of uh, logging. And ProGuard can remove logging code and just by doing that he got an, imp uh, an important improvement in battery life. This isn't very typical but I just thought that it was nice enough to show. So hopefully I've convinced you that ProGuard can be useful uh, if you haven't used it already. So you can easily give it a try just by commenting in a single line in the project of properties file. Uh, it's the ProGuard config line and there's this hash mark that you have to remove. Uh, if you've done that, if you built release versions of your code, of your application, ProGuard will automatically be applied 
So it can be easy as just doing this uh, thing, single thing. Uh, it doesn't get applied to debug builds, uh, not in Eclipse or not in Ant, uh, but in exports in Eclipse and in release builds in Ant, it does get applied. And I assume that this is getting more um, flexible in the upcoming Gradle build as well. Now I'll descend to a slightly lower technical uh, level uh, where I'll talk a little bit about what goes on internally in, uh, in ProGuard, what it actually does to your code. And it probably teaches you something about uh, how you can use ProGuard optimally. There are actually th three steps inside ProGuard. First, there is a shrinking step, then there is this optimization step, and then there is the obfuscation step. Uh, shrinking is sometimes called tree shaking, and that's quite a nice visual metaphor where you can think of a tree which has all these uh, leaves and branches, but also dead leaves and dead branches. And if you now hold on to the trunk and shake it firmly, all the dead leaves and branches come flying out and you end up with a clean and healthy tree. This is what ProGuard does to your code, digitally then, at least. Uh, it Assume that, uh, or suppose that you have this uh, whole structure of classes and dependencies between these classes. The classes have fields and methods inside of them, but there are also unused parts. Well, ProGuard holds onto your code, shakes it, and all the unused classes come flying out. And, and also the unused fields and unused methods. And what you end up is, uh, with is what you have on the right hand side um, the clean version of your code. And note that th this stage, it's actually exactly the same code that gets executed when you ru run your application. It's just that the dead code, the, the unused parts, have been removed. So it's cleaner and more compact, but the code is actually uh, running exactly the same way as it was before. Uh, an interesting thing or important thing to me not mention here is that ProGuard has to hold on to your code in some way there has to be an entry point to your code, because if ProGuard would just shake your code heavily and uh, it would remove the unused parts, it would remove everything, you would end up with an application that's zero bytes uh, large, it's optimal, but it doesn't do much anymore. Uh, so you have to hold on to the entry points, and in this case, uh, in Android applications, those are the activities, the services, the applications of your uh, application. And for that, ProGuard needs some uh, configuration, and this is the easy part. Uh, the entry points are provided to you uh, by the Android SDK. It automatically writes out a configuration file similar to the one that you can see here, and it will, um, by having that configuration, just keep all your activities, and ProGuard will figure out what else is uh, needed in your application and remove everything that is not needed. So that's the easy part. You don't have to do anything for this. But uh, there is one point where you have to pay attention. And this is where your application uses introspection or reflection. Uh, because that's something that ProGuard can't analyze automatically. That's something you generally can't see uh, by static analysis. Uh, and it's something that you have to configure. It's always possible to come up with a, a working configuration, but you simply have to know how and uh, just add those few lines that you need to get your application working. Now, this reflection can be going on in your own code, where you have a, a class for name call or a class.get method call, but it could also be uh, that you are using some external framework work, like Google's protocol buffers or Juice, RoboJuice, uh, as shown here, or uh, maybe Jackson for um, JSON. And in those cases, they're used, uh, those libraries those that you use are processed together with ProGuard, uh, together with your own application by ProGuard. And uh, also in those cases, you have to know what these libraries are doing in your application, how they are treating those classes how they are using reflection and introspection on those classes. Uh, in the case of uh, RoboJuice, you might need a configuration like this one. It's, this is a, it's short, but it's already pretty advanced. It uh, shows how you could keep all the fields, for instance, that have some inject annotation. Uh, this is one of the many examples, and 
unfortunately, many people are asking uh, for the one magical uh, configuration that does it all. And unfortunately, that doesn't exist. You have to know how your application works, and you have to provide some specific uh, configuration. In some cases, uh, there might be configurations floating around for specific libraries that might be useful for you as well. Another uh, practical tip that might be useful, uh, and this is the number one issue that comes up on Stack Overflow, for instance, uh, it's that ProGuard operates under a closed world assumption. That means that um, it has to know everything about your classes, about the class hierarchy uh, that you provide to ProGuard. It's just like a compiler. You, if you compile some code from scratch, you have to provide all the libraries or the compiler will simply stop and say, well, uh, unresolved reference or something like that. And that's what ProGuard does, it well, does as well. It can provide or it can print out warnings about uh, classes that it can't find, even though they are referenced from other classes. Now, this is a very common issue because uh, often you're using external libraries and they might depend on some other library, but it's not actually used uh, in your application. And ProGuard will complain about it. Now, if you know better, because you've developed the application and you've tested it, then uh, you can tell ProGuard that it's okay. You can reassure it and uh, say, uh, don't warn about this uh, little issue. Uh, just ignore it, continue processing, and uh, all will be fine. And this is one of the, the examples where the Twitter API seems to depend on the uh, Apache logging API. If you don't have that logging API in your libs directory, um, that doesn't seem to matter too much. It, it, uh, it doesn't seem to hurt the, the code. And then you can tell ProGuard that uh, it can ignore all warnings about the Twitter API. So this is uh, something you, you can take away if you ever run into some warnings like this. OK, so I've talked about shrinking and some tips uh, related to it. Uh, ProGuard also performs optimization, just like many optimizing compilers. Now, there are a whole series of optimizations that are supported and uh, implemented. But uh, I won't go into the details of all of that. What I'll just show you is my favorite example. Suppose you have a piece of code like this. And it, uh, I'm showing the Java code here. ProGuard is actually working on the, the bytecode, not on the source code. Uh, but suppose uh, that you have a, a sim simple uh, method here, compute answer. Uh, it does some operations on its arguments. It calls itself uh, with different arguments. And there is a single invocation of this method uh, with constant arguments. Now, if you provide this to ProGuard, the first thing it will notice is that there is this still recursive call of the compute answer method. And it will replace that code by uh, an iteration instead of a recursive call. Now, if this recursive call ends, the iteration uh, will provide the same result. It's still not quite clear what it does, but uh, I can assure you that it's equivalent. Uh, at that point, ProGuard sees that there's just this single invocation left of this compute answer method. And this single invocation has all constant arguments. So what ProGuard will do is inline all those constant arguments into the place, uh, into the, the header of the, the, the method. And at that point, it can start doing data flow analysis and control flow analysis, which is quite complex internally. But eventually, it can figure out that the answer of this method is always the same. And it's, in hindsight, the obvious answer, uh, 42. That's quite uh, a big step, but it's not quite done yet there because this is now a, a very simple method. It's short and it even provides a, a constant answer. Uh, and at that point, it can just inline that uh, into the point, into the place where it was invoked. So you end up with very short, uh, a very short piece of code. It's not uh, a very typical example. Maybe you might think it's a bit contrived, but it happens quite often that you have uh, constant arguments or arguments that aren't used. Uh, so cases like these uh, might occur a lot in practice as well. And uh, just by combining these, all these little optimizations, you might get some more impressive results. <laughs> 
And this is my favorite example because uh, actually I was testing this tail recursive uh, optimization and I was looking at the bytecode before processing and bytecode after processing and my method was gone. And this is a place where ProGuard had outsmarted me because it noticed that the method wasn't necessary at all anymore and had just removed it. So now I'm constantly fighting with ProGuard if I'm testing optimizations that it should leave some code alone and just show me what, uh, what I'm trying to test. Okay, so optimization is uh, a lot of fun and it can be useful also. Uh, how can you enable it? Unfortunately, it's not enabled by default, but you can modify that project.properties file uh, just slightly, in, uh, insert that optimized word there, and then it will apply the optimizations as well. Uh, the Google engineers disabled this at some point because this is the most complex part of ProGuard and it's also more the, the part that contains the most bugs. Uh, but by now it's, it's pretty stable and I don't think there is any serious issue uh, that's still in there. A small tip here, uh, if you want to remove logging code, that's not just an ordinary optimization, it actually changes your program. But still you can convince ProGuard to perform that optimization or perform that change by just letting it assume that these logging methods don't have any side effects. And ProGuard will see that their return values aren't used and it will just remove the invocations to those methods. And then your logging will be uh, removed in a simple way without needing any flags or without needing to modify your source code. Okay, so I've discussed shrinking optimization and the final step is obfuscation. And this is traditional name obfuscation that you might be familiar with, uh, where all the ident identifiers in the code are renamed. So class names, field names, method names, they're all renamed to short, meaningless names. And it can also remove uh, debug information that's not necessary for the execution of the code, like line numbers and uh, local variable names. Uh, just a simple example to show you what that could look like. Suppose you have a, a class like this. Uh, it has quite uh, meaningful identifiers. Uh, if you apply obfuscation to some class like this, uh, you might end up with uh, a smaller class uh, that looks like this, where the identifiers contain lots of A's, B's, C's, and so on. So if you apply ProGuard, this is typically what a program, a program will uh, look like. Of course, there are certain methods that can't be renamed. If you have an activity with an onCreate method, you can't rename that onCreate method because then your application would be broken. And ProGuard knows about that and uh, due to its configuration and its uh, analysis, and it won't do that. A small note here about um, optimization versus obfuscation. Sometimes people say, just give me the obfuscation. I want to protect my application and I'm not interested in optimization or the other way around. But actually they're more closely related than you would imagine at first uh, sight. If you apply optimization, you start from your nicely structured uh, code with classes and uh, nice getters and setters in them and nicely packaged in various packages. But ProGuard starts working on that code, uh, changing it to something that's far less recognizable. So if I look at my own code after it has been optimized, it's very hard for me to recognize what the original code corresponds to in, in the process version. And the other way around also, uh, the obfuscation compacts the code, so you end up with something that's smaller, and that's also a kind of optimization. So both steps irreversibly remove information from your code, and they're, in a sense, closely related. So uh, if you want to learn more about uh, details and about uh, all the options that you have in ProGuard, you can uh, look at the ProGuard guide in the Android SDK. That's just a single page that explains how you can enable ProGuard. If you want to learn a bit more about uh, actually configuring ProGuard, you can head to the website. Uh, it's at SourceForge. Uh, 
and uh, I really recommend the manual, um, which I've uh, spent a lot of time on, if you want to learn uh, about the basic principles. And also, most importantly, maybe there's a troubleshooting section in there, which uh, can help you a lot if you run into any typical problem, because it has a accumulated no knowledge of uh, what we've done, uh, what people have done, and what I've done uh, over the years. So before I conclude, I, I'll tell you about my startup uh, in just four slides. So the work was getting a little bit too much, uh, and I'm now working on it full time. Uh, we're still developing ProGuard as a, an open source project, and actually version 4.9 was released two weeks ago. It contains a Gradle task and some uh, enhancements, and it's actually <coughs> quite easy to upgrade in your Android SDK. You just have to pick the jar out of the distribution and install it in your Android SDK. Everything is still compatible, and it will just work with the, the latest features uh, enabled. Uh, as happens so often in, uh, in, in startups around open source projects, there is a support uh, section that we provide. So mostly for more complex projects, uh, we can help getting the most out of it, uh, getting the, the most optimal configuration uh, for ProGuard in Android and also outside of Android, where uh, configurations tend to be more complex. And finally, we have a, an actual commercial product, which is a follow-on to ProGuard, and that's DexGuard. And this is actually a closed source uh, product. product. Uh, it's um, commercial, and it contains all kinds of features that are less suited for an open source project. Uh, so it's compatible with ProGuard. It uses the same configuration, but uh, this one is specialized for Android. So it can uh, not only work on the Java bytecode, but it also actually produces a Delphic bytecode, and it can work on the XML files, the resource files, and on the asset files, uh, and it, can, uh, it, it offers more features in terms of obfuscation mostly, and application protection. Because as much as I like the optimization aspect of ProGuard, because there are some interesting challenges uh, there, uh, what developers are often asking is more protection for their apps. It's uh, the, the horror stories you hear uh, are pretty grim if, if you listen to developers. Uh, so in terms of application protection, it provides a series of uh, proactive changes to the code, uh, which you could actually apply manually and which are also recommended by Google engineers. Uh, but DexGuard can provide them automatically for you on your code, and it can probably do a lot of these things more effectively. If you're interested in any of these things, please head over to the Psychoa website, which is our startup. And uh, with that, I'll finish my presentation, and I'll uh, leave, leave it to you. If you have any questions, you can ask them now, or you can catch me later on. <laughs>